morning, everyone, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this panel today uh, at the Lipponi School of Public Policy. My name is Ramkishan Rajan. I'm a professor of international economics here at the school. Uh, so today's panel is about, uh, I'll read out the title, How to Ensure Safety of Financial Innovations, Europe and Asian Perspectives. So financial, we, we were having the discussion briefly about with, I was talking to panelists and this whole issue of what is fintech. We'll come, we'll come back to that. But for now, so if you think about financial innovations or fintech more generally, that's clearly emerged as a revolutionary force in the industry. Sort of, it's transforming the financial industry and blurring industrial boundaries, which is one of the one of the ambiguities about what we mean by fintech because the industrial boundaries are getting blurred. One can draw parallels between what is happening in the finance industry uh, to disruptions in the retail with Amazon, Uber and transport, Airbnb in the hotel industry, Netflix and media, so on and so forth. Um, but it seems to be that the power of incumbency, at least among the large banks, tends to be a bit stronger in the financial industry, an issue to think about. So examples of fintech abound, obviously, P2P lending, digital wallets, robo-advisors, crowdfunding, aggregators, innovative trading platforms, crowd, uh, crowdfunding, cryptocurrencies, uh, list goes on. So what's driving, so I'm an economist, so when I think about these things, so I'm not, we'll hear about the regulatory dimension. So but when I think about fintech, obviously we think about sort of what are the dri what are the drivers. So when you think about you have the supply side and the demand side. On the supply side, we have wide ranging a wide range of technologies, new paradigms in IT like cloud computing, mobile technologies, big data, AI, break breakthroughs in cryptography, dis distributed computing, etc. That's on the technology side. On the regulatory side, obviously, greater regulatory challenges, especially to global banks uh, uh, post global financial crisis. Also, the issue of QE and the availability of cheap funding, which has helped give rise uh, to fintechnopreneurs, as it were. The, uh, the funding that I mentioned uh, is obviously important. And on the demand side, obviously, demo, uh, demographics, millennials are much more comfortable with mobile phones and they want personalized services. Uh, financial and exclusion. Banks historically have ignored large chunks of the population and sort of uh, smaller fintech companies have realized there's scope there for them to come in. Um, and some financial services are still high cost, which is sort of, in, to some extent, in terms of wealth management, the rise of robo-advisors, in the case of uh, the fintech companies in remittances, et cetera, right? So you have various things going on on the demand side. So far, most of the innovations to date, to date at least the ones we have seen, have been in the retail payments uh, services like digital wallets, lending and customer relationships, but wholesale payments, clearing and settlement infrastructure is also going through a major change with the advent of blocktail, blockchain technology. That's, that's going to be the interesting new big thing. I say new, it's, it's obviously, obviously happening, but it'll be interesting to see what happens over time. So innovation in this industry as well as generally is growth enhancing, but obviously quite dis can be quite disruptive for the industry, whether it's incumbents or, or with regard to jobs. And obviously very challenging for central banks and financial regulators who have to manage the risks uh, that arise from these innovations. What are some of the risks? We'll hear about them in more detail today. But data privacy concerns, cybersecurity issues, more points, potential points of failure and uh, financial stress in the system due to interconnected agents, excessive volatility due to high frequency trading, issues relating to fraud, Ponzi schemes, etc. So how do we strike the right balance between promoting innovations, competition, and ensuring consumers benefit via convenience and personalization of services on the one hand, while ensuring safety and data privacy on the other? Interesting question. I have absolutely no idea. Luckily for us, we have, a, we have lined up a very good uh, set of experts today from Europe and Asia. Let me briefly um, in introduce them uh, and then I'll invite them onto the stage. I'm, going to, I'm not going to do justice to their long bios because I really want to get the discussion going. So if you don't mind, I'll be brief uh, um, uh, with the introduction. Um, Mr. Marek Szernowski is chairman of KNF, which is the Financial Supervision Authority at, uh, in Poland. Uh, so, he, a, a position he's held since October 2016. Prior to that, he was a member of uh, the Polish Monetary Policy Council. He graduated from the War Warsaw School of Economics, where he's still an associate uh, pr uh, professor. Um, Mr. Damien Pang, uh, he's head, head technology. <laughs> Damien is the head of technology infrastructure office under the FinTech and Innovation Group at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and he's responsible for regulatory policies and strategies for developing safe and efficient technology-enabled infrastructures for the financial sector. Um, Ms. Sonia Vedrikovic. Please. 
Sonia's the managing director, head of consumer bank technology, DBS Bank Singapore. She joined DBS in February 2015 as MD of the digital bank division before taking on her current role. Um, she was a former country head of consumer bank at Standard Chartered in Australia. Like Marek, she has a strong Warsaw School of Economics connection, having received her uh, master's degree from there. And then, um, Mr. Matthias, yo. He's. He's a CTO, Chief Technology of Officer at Asian Semantic Corporation, responsible for driving the organization's solution strategy and technology vision throughout Asia Pacific. He serves as an advisor to senior executives who he helps in strategizing and improving the overall security postures for their respective organizations. So what I'll do, I'm gonna take a seat right now, but what I thought I'd do is, since we have speakers coming from different backgrounds, I'd give them maybe a two minute intervention to talk about issues that they are thinking about in this broad area of financial innovation and uh, uh, regulations and security, and then sort of we'll open up the discussion. Okay. Mark, it's a, whatever you're comfortable with. Well, I'm comfortable. Okay, yeah. well, if, if, if you want. Okay. Thank you very much, for, first of all, for invitation. It's a great honor to me to, to be here and, and have the opportunity to speak about Poland, about our uh, supervisory regulatory perspective on, on on fintech, sorry. Uh, Maybe a bit higher. A little okay. bit higher, yeah. It's should be this way. Yes. Yeah. So shall I shall, shall I repeat the beginning? <laughs> Thank you again for invitation. It's a great honor uh, that I can be here and 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 uh, 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 share with you some thoughts about uh, Polish economy, Polish uh, uh, banking sector, Polish financial sector and uh, uh, the way we supervise it and, and regulate it. It's also a great honor to, to be here as a, a professor of economy. I uh, heard a lot about, uh, about your uh, School of, of Public Policy, about uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public, Public Policy. So I'm here as a regulator, as an academic teacher, as a professor of, of economy. Uh, I represent uh, Polish Polish government, and uh, uh, I'm proud that that we have uh, steady growth of over four percent annually. Uh, we keep growing. We're we're a very open, democratic uh, country. Our financial sector is is growing at uh, a steady pace right now. We have no irregularities right now. We, we're trying to to manage uh, the system in in very conservative way. When you look at our monetary policies, it's conservative, and I, I may say that that also regulatory policy is is quite conservative. We live in two two dimensions. We try to to connect. Uh, it's European one and Polish one. When we talk about regulatory perspective, we have. Uh, uh, directives and regulations were coherent with European market. We're, we're also a part of European market, so so uh, every entity that that is uh, active in Poland can be also active uh, in any other European uh, country. And of course, we have this this Polish perspective. Uh, uh, we try to to do our best to. Uh, to provide competitive environment for, for financial institutions and for fintechs. And uh, I'm here also uh, to, to share, you, share with you my thoughts about and, and all, all insights concerning uh, what we are doing right now to improve our competitiveness in case of, of uh, supporting of uh, financial uh, innovations. I mean, fintechs. We're doing a lot. We've done a lot over last uh, last year, and I'm proud of that. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, we keep this position of uh, regional leader in, in fintech. Uh, it's also very important uh, that we are signing an agreement with uh, MAS, and that's also why why we're here, because you're, you're global leader, and that's why we, it's it's so important to us to. To, to exchange experience, to exchange thoughts, to, 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 uh, to update uh, uh, information about how we deal with, with, uh, with fintechs, with uh, 
financial institutions in, in Singapore and uh, of, course, uh, of course in Poland. Uh, from, uh, I have still a little oh, bit more time. So let's, let's hear let's, from the others yeah. and then we'll have a discussion, Sonia. Okay. So I just, uh, okay, just, I just realized, can you hear me? Uh, that I'm in a quite interesting position because being Polish, I'm responsible <laughs> for shaping the technology strategy of the biggest bank in Singapore, DBS Bank. So that leads me at the crossroads of, the, of my Polish origin and my Singapore span of what I'm doing right now. Um, I guess being a representative of a um, commercial um, entity in that panel, I'm very much interested to discuss uh, how we, the banks and financial institutions, are shaping our strategies while uh, discussing them with the regulators. I was uh, lucky enough to be involved in the implementation of our Digibank, a challenger bank in India and Indonesia. Uh, that in less than 18 months brought about 1.6 million customers, a bank without branches, a bank without a contact center, a bank virtually without operations, and yet a bank that was not only able to acquire as many customers, but is also able to get the know your customer policy without physically seeing the customer. So as you could imagine, without, throughout the journey, I was very much involved in the regulators, not just in Singapore, but also in the, in the neighboring countries. And one thing which I've realized uh, these days is that regulators are no longer talking to us, the commercial institutions, about the letter of the law or regulations, because these were developed many years ago, where many of the technology capabilities which were implemented and developed in the last couple of years did not exist. The signature was the strongest way of authentication of the customer many years ago. These days, biometric verification is so much stronger. So when we talk to the regulators regarding uh, the spirit of what we really want to achieve, and we are bringing technologies that are able to provide a much stronger um, enablement of those uh, principles, uh, we are seeing a lot of openness and a lot of um, great conversation and also regulations following. Mm. So for me, I'm, I'm actually very happy to be on that panel uh, to hear what's going on in Poland and. Uh, also get the updates of the latest in, in, uh, in Singapore, but also share our perspective on how our conversations are going and how we manage to cooperate with the regulators now more than any time in the past to actually shape the future together. So, so do you mean you'll give us the updates? <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to uh, 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 spoil what's coming ahead for the, the rest of the week, <laughs> as you're well aware of yeah. uh, the FinTech Festival that's ongoing. Today is the day one. Uh, I, I just uh, uh, think on the point where uh, the, the regulator has to recognize the environment is changing. And whether you like it or not, it's going to be very much, the landscape is going to very much change with the introduction of technology. And in, in reality, the technology itself is, is you're, you're seeing that the, the, what's happening around us has already been shaped by the use of technology. You're very familiar, some of you probably has come here using Uber or Grab, um, ordered food maybe last night using one of those uh, food delivery channels, uh, Food Panda or, or, or others. So you realize that you have already started to engage in all those various uh, parts of your life through technology. So why not financial services? And, and as, as, as a regulator, you've got to accept that uh, this change is going to come. This transformation will come, and it's already here, if not, uh, probably not very widely uh, distributed, but it's here. So as a regulator, we, we need to play a role in the sense of, do we then stop it? But we know that that's not possible. So the best to go around doing it is that we harness it to the best that we can in terms of its benefits, but while at the same time, Managing those risks, those risks that may emerge by virtue of introductions of those new technologies. So there are many technologies that allows us uh, 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 um, to harness, to glean benefits, but they also introduce their own uh, nuance in terms of risk. And that is, as a regulator, we have to be mindful about the ability, the, our regulations, our environment to allow financial institutions and the fintech players alike to be able to harness those technologies to the best that it can, at the same time allowing 
risk to be managed. So that, that's a, uh, a key approach that MAS has taken, and um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, we will discuss a bit more as we uh, explore the various topics. Yeah, uh, my name is Matthias. I come from a company called Symantec. Many of you might be using our product. If you heard about Norton, it's actually under Symantec company. So my background is cybersecurity. Uh, I, I was originally from MinDev, and uh, I think this has been one of the heightened concern. You know, technology is no longer just enabling business. Today, technology is business. It is like their one. I live in a world where, I mean like what Damien has shared, I live in a world where Pizza Hut is just literally 10 minutes from my house, and I order pizza from my phone. That's how we are. I mean, that's how I am. <laughs> we are, I'm that lazy. But technology is bringing us a lot of convenience. And in fact, many of us, our lives are changed. Our behavior are changed because of technology. I mean, I will always, always ask this in conferences, but you know, on a show of, I mean, just think about it. What's the first thing you do when you wake up this morning? Besides opening your eyes. You know, what's the first thing you do? Do you check your wife? Is she sleeping? Brush your teeth? Take a bath? Or check your phone? If anybody WhatsApp you, anybody email you. you know, this is our behavior now. It's like, sign, you know, health uh, experts say that it's not good for our health, but we do it anyway. So this is shaping our behavior. And the data that was collected at the back end does have a huge impact about how they understand us as a consumer. So a lot of times, cybersecurity is not, even, is not considered when startups start having evolution of technology. And that's where something that we felt that it should be an architecture uh, fundamentals, where you need to protect the information they collect. Whether is it transactional, whether is it on uh, personal profiles. And I think that's one of the things that uh, is, is, is a heightened discussion right now. How and where should it, this come in to make sure that the database that we have that contains all the information are being protected. Yeah. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, uh, you know, there are two ways you can run a panel. One is give the panelists all the questions beforehand and it becomes sort of very organized or do it the way I like to do it, which is just not tell them what I plan on asking and let's, <laughs> let's have a free flow. Okay? So that's what I'd like to do here. So let me maybe start at the at a more general level first. Um, I'll certainly take questions, but let's start our discussion. So this is more, I guess, for Marek and Damien. So what was the general issue? Can a, can a regulator, so MS is obviously a case in point, but a more general uh, question. Can a regulator also be a facilitator of innovation? Is there any tension or oxymoron there? Can well, you be, yeah. Either one. Or <laughs> Damien, you want to start? <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 like I'll start. To I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think the as, as mentioned earlier that the, the we we are waking up in the real world in the sense that um, change is upon us, change that's very much influenced by technology. Regulator must recognize first and foremost that, and if it is clear that the future of financial services is going to be very much transformed, changed by technology, then it has to wear the hat concurrently as one that not only develops but also facilitates. Develops from the perspective of how do you create the kind of environment, how do you create the kind of opportunities for parties to be able to come together, be it the incumbent financial institutions, be it the fintech players, the technology platform providers, the opportunities, and as well as the, the, the parties who provide the risk capital, and the parties who provide the, tech, the talents itself to be able to uh, support this whole ecosystem itself. So it needs to be able to provide all the connection points, bring them all together to make it a, a sustainable ecosystem, to bring about the best chance at which the financial industry can transform. But transform not just for the sake of transforming, but ultimately for the benefits of consumers, ultimately to become more efficient. And of course, financial services is all about risk management. So the abilities for the financial institutions to better manage risk. So I think that is, a, a, the, the regulator itself has to play the kind of multiple roles. There is some form of uh, 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 splitting of personality it has to. But I think it is all in the good name of the outcome intended. Uh, well, one of the first things I, I did as a chairman of, of Polish FSA was to ask Polish Parliament to add another purpose of, of our uh, existence. It was uh, 
support of financial innovation. That's, that's why I have, uh, let's say, um, right now I am, I'm le legally also responsible for support of, of financial innovation in Poland. I, I personally believe that without innovation there's, there's no growth. So, so we have to support innovation on, on the one hand. On the other hand, we have uh, customers, we have uh, all those who are clients of financial institutions. So, so uh, we have to um, also think about, uh, of course, security of, of uh, fintech, of uh, security of uh, financial innovation. So we have to provide some, some regulatory fr framework to to, to give the, the, the certainty of the system, of sustainability, to, to keep the system sustainable, as, as you mentioned. So, uh, but this regulatory framework should also be uh, consistent in order to limit uh, transactional costs. Yes, so it's, it's not, uh, 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 so I, I share fully what you've said, we have to, to coexist, I mean market and, and regulator, and uh, uh, regulators should act in a way that, that, that uh, from one side uh, gives uh, this, this uh, consistent uh, regulatory framework and from the other side protects cre credibility of the market itself. Because another thing very, very of, of the great importance is the fact that we have a lot of new technologies uh, that were not proven or we're proving them right now, and we have to be certain that, uh, so that they won't uh, change the, the perception of the whole financial uh, system. And uh, that's why security, I, I underline it very often, is, is so important, because uh, if we be too much, I, I would say, uh, mm, uh, oriented on, on, on competition, on, on market, in, in, some, in some cases, we could lose this perspective of, of security. And uh, I will try to do all, all I can, uh, all we can as a regulator, to, to keep those words together. I mean, a uh, consistent regulatory framework that, that provides secure um, solutions and as much market as this could be, as to be as much liberal as, as uh, this could be. I, we learn a lot from, from our history. We were, uh, we were former uh, centrally planned economy, then we, were, we, we go fully liberal, and we see that it's not the solution. The, the market, not, not the market, the, the government uh, should be strong, as it is in, in Singapore. So, the country, the, the country should be strong and there should be also uh, as, mu as much market as, as this could be. And we should look uh, for the best, uh, let's say, combination of, of, those, of those two words. That's why I, I believe that we can learn a lot from Singapore because we're looking for the right balance between uh, market and, and, and government right now. Yeah, maybe so, if I would just add on to yeah. Mr. Marek's point with regards to the look, we fully resonate that the, the common view of that there are uh, the white interests to support innovation, the white interest to allow the incumbents to be able to take on those innovation in a safe manner in a sense. That I think is 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 truly essential. Because if you look at financial services, as I mentioned earlier, it's about trust, it's about risk management. As financial services move onto the digital realm. Your customers will only use those digital financial services to the extent at which they trust that their money is safe, their information is safe. That, that, that is the, just the bottom line statement that as we move towards transformation of the financial services. And I, I think regulators around the world, including MAS, is also on a learning journey as well as the financial industry undertakes its transformation brought on through technology. We do not have all the answers. In fact, one of the key reasons why we set up the regular sandbox is to allow us the opportunities to be able to test some of those new technologies that's enabling certain financial, innovative financial services. We wish we know all the answers in terms of all the regulations. Some we can 
anticipate by virtue of principles. If I give you an example of the introductions of robo advisors or digital advisors, some of you may be using, what kind of rules that will be applicable to them in the new world? Do we protect the interests of the investors? How do we make sure that the algorithms that goes behind the scene that's helping us do our investments, portfolio management, is doing what it's supposed to be doing? At MAS, we have, for the purpose of the digital advisors, we've issued a set of regulations. We have simplified some of those areas to allow consumers and investors to be able to harness digital advisors with certain expectations levied on providers and services in terms of what they expect to do in terms of looking at their algorithms, looking in terms of the kind of investors and the kind of products that will be exposed through such digital advisors. So we are trying to do both as a regulator, on one hand, based on the principles towards the various areas of consumer protection, investor protection, safety of the market itself, stability, and on the other hand, allowing the innovation to take place. And that is the kind of complexities we are facing. Sonia, you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted <coughs> to give a couple of examples where uh, the regulations became a true enabler uh, for the banks to pursue um, the new economy. Um, I will give you an example from the Indian market, the ADAR regulations for those that do not know. ADAR is a biometric ID that has been um, started in uh, India many years ago, and a couple of years ago actually, and now uh, there is about one billion of Indians that are carrying an ID which does not hold the biometric information. The biometric information is stored at the central uh, database of the, of the uh, government. Uh, the um, regulator in India has allowed the banks to use that data in order to biometrically verify the customers and, and perform a know your customer uh, exercise which is so important every time we open an account. That opened a way to start banks that are digital only, banks that have no branches, they do not need to have um, a specific places where you see the customers physically. It can be done through the ecosystem partners that can provide the biometric verification. In Singapore, the new regulations regarding the MyInfo, where upon customer consent, um, the banks can pull up the data from the, uh, from the Minister of Manpower and the Tax Office to open an account. And we've got a lot of information. Again, the customer does not need to come um, to the uh, bank we can open the account fully uh, digitally and in the future we can use that information to provide loans. So these are some of those regulations which really were great enablers for the bank to start uh, going to a different level of providing the digitally um, uh, powered services uh, to the customers. On the other side, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, I'm not uh, long in that um, space, but I think that now more than ever the regulators are inviting the players of the market to co-create the regulations with them. The whole consultation that is taking place because the field is an unknown to all of us and everybody is contributing the knowledge. I think the regulations that, especially in Singapore, I will comment on the regulations regarding regulatory sandbox, which came last year, amazing regulations. The whole open API playbook, which uh, set the tone for many of much of the work that we started doing in our own fields. Um, the, the regulations regarding cloud, which uh, came in force last year, again provided a lot of guidance for many of the banks who were, were a little bit lost of what is allowed, what is not allowed, how we can go into that amazing space. Um, the recent work relating to blockchain, which I'm hearing some announcements are going to be made, it's public already, <laughs> 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 during, the, during the, the FinTech uh, festival. And, um, and also the robo-advisory, which is still in the type of the consultation type of the mode, but it's one of the big things that is going to change the way we are democratizing the whole um, investment, um, providing the investment services uh, to our customers. So um, I can give you a lot of examples, especially from that part of the world. And I know that Marek and his team being in Poland a couple of uh, months ago and talking to them, is actually changing the way that is cooperating with the commercial industry in order to co-create uh, the new regulations in order to facilitate the technologies that are coming upon. I would like to one, give one rejoinder and then a we'll short, 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 short example. We, ten months ago, we created a special task, task force that is dedicated to, to the barriers that uh, fintechs uh, uh, find on the, on, uh, from the regulator's side. And uh, this task force, uh, uh, those are 22 entities that uh, are on constant, let's say, di dialogue 
uh, with us and uh, they right now uh, showed us over 100 barriers and those barriers from from different let's say points of of, of fintech industry uh, mobile payments from from uh, uh, telemetry for example in insurance companies uh, because we supervise also insurance companies and, and, and cop capital markets and uh, concerning blockchain technology and so on and, and so on but but we've got this this task force and uh, it it uh, works on on daily basis so we, we're not only preparing uh, some kind of report to close the the subject but to uh, on, on this basis, we created uh, innovation innovation hub in, in KNF Polish Polish FSA. We're thinking about regulatory sandbox, and we're trying to change Polish regulations in order to to stimulate this 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 industry. I mean fintech industry, innovation technologies, uh, fi fin inno uh, financial innovation in Poland. So so uh, the regula regula regulatory perspective is changing over time yeah and uh, it's, it's something i know that that you're also uh, doing here in so singapore yeah so thank you thank you uh, so since some some of the panelists brought this up so blockchains blockchains distributed ledger so ravi menon md of mas um, has written some really nice speeches on uh, uh, issues relating to financial innovation so he, he says uh, blockchains and distributed ledger system this is potentially the most transformative innovation uh, at least until artificial intelligence comes along. So everyone who talks about blockchain talks about how it's decentralized, it's, it's going to be much less uh, risky, in some sense it's almost foolproof. Um, uh, obviously nothing is foolproof, uh, but uh, uh, do, do panelists have views on that? Matthias, do you want to start talking yeah. about it? So just to also share to what many people have understood, blockchain is something that we know, yet we don't know. So it's a very, uh, uh, thing that often is in our mind to talk about what is the future that belongs in this world. So just to share, uh, share about what blockchain does, yeah, you're right, it's a distributed ledger. Or I won't say distributed is the wrong word. Decentralized ledger. Okay. The objective is to do away with this terminology called middleman. The objective is to make transactions faster because of, and also cheaper, uh, in terms of uh, getting uh, the, the synchronized uh, database out, and also to have everyone, I mean the challenges here is, how do you have a distributed or decentralized uh, ledger, but yet having a synchronization? And that's why blockchain solve, right, has a very big impact. Because in this decentralized world, and it's only coming up in the last few years, uh, one of the reasons why was, you know, internet was only a few nodes back then. Uh, when I say back then, it's about 20 years ago. But today, everybody has internet. And in fact, you are, you're gonna see some of this live streaming uh, 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 information and, and all these are from your YouTube and all, all decentralized. You're having PCs that's connected without wires now in this day and age to just get the information you need. So in the decentralized world, the toughest and the most challenging thing is the word trust. And blockchain bridge the gap. And that's why with that, there's a lot of dynamic, when I say it's security implication, it's going to have a lot of dynamic uh, implication in terms of building more trust in the system. In fact, we have seen some technologies like even cybersecurity, using blockchain to stop more uh, attacks. Like for example, one of them are using blockchains to have a, if you are, understand, if you are more technology savvy, you understand the term called DNS. DNS means that uh, how you resolve uh, a, a resolution name to an IP address to then go to the site that you want. But because of the poisoning of DNS, it's possible that people uh, use this as a denial of service attack. Or I need to understand the term again. So sorry for all the technical stuff. But now they're using blockchain to validate all those added components or the ledgers or the added, like, added entries to make it more, more robust. So is it more robust in terms of your transaction? It is. So you can add blockchain to, you know, many of us equate blockchain as Bitcoin because both start with B, right? People get confused. <laughs> yeah. So Bitcoin is just a cryptocurrency that blockchain has existed while, a while back that leverage on this and become popular because of that. And they can now verify the transaction of Bitcoins but then they realize that they can small usage of blockchain, like for example, supply chain, document validity, and even you know, coming to this world of what? Keyless signature, where it allows you to validate a, a sensitive document that was being added into the chain to ensure that the validity of the, the, the change, the editing or the origin and traceability of all the who's the owner is. So there's so much dynamic uh, use of blockchain now. And the implication of financial service is that, that 
more and more, I would say, companies, startups, to leverage on this to bring more, more traceability, more security to the transactions or even to you know, the things that they are holding on to, like even protecting sensitive documents, uh, starting to leverage on that to secure cryptocurrency conversions. So these are the usage of how blockchain is going to be evolving. You are right. Indeed, it's one of the uh, most interesting and if not one of the things that to look out for in the next three years and how it's going to be evolved in terms of artificial intelligence, securing of data and so on. There must be some downside. Hmm. Well, there, to be honest, uh, the downsides actually existed a few months, a few years back, I would say. But slowly, they are add, adding on to this, what is so-called downside as security, as a component to protect them. One of the things that um, was noticed was because blockchain, uh, blockchain allows you to, you must publish, you must be open about the transaction. Like for example, let's say talk about Bitcoin, how blockchain protect Bitcoin. You must know who has been transacted with what. So to a certain level of uh, nature, privacy is being compromised. Mm. Uh, not compromised, I would say. More like uh, privacy have to be have to be a little bit of exposed. But then again, now they are adding cryptography into blockchain. So that's why there are downsides. And blockchain is like any other startups. When you introduce a technology like that, that tends to be a weakness. And now they are adding component to address the weakness. Mm. And I think that's why this is a technology that's ever evol evolving and being adopted by many companies, uh, I would say startups, who saw the value, how this can change the industry of how they're working today. Okay. Yeah. Anyone, Damien, you want yeah. to say? Yeah, maybe I'll just add on a few points. Mm -hmm. the, as, as Sonia has mentioned, the, the, uh, yes, MES is, together with the industry, uh, has done some work with regards to the use of distributed ledger technology itself, applied in the interbank, uh, wholesale banking payments area. And we're going to, together with the industry itself, release the report, as well as the source codes that uh, has been done on the various uh, technologies, digital technology itself, uh, to the open source domain this week. And that's something that uh, we hope that uh, it will allow the community itself to look at this report, look at this source code itself, be able to uh, get their hands dirty play with those source codes itself and be able to enhance on them. Because from our point of view, distributed ledger technology itself has immense potential to be applied in the various financial services use cases. But of course, as a technology, it has to overcome a lot of challenges, a lot of hard problems to solve before it can be used. And that is the, the reality of the day. And through the experiments that we have done most recently with the industry, we've tried to overcome some of those key challenges mentioned earlier about the uh, hard problem of privacy. Everyone wants to keep their transactions, don't want to let other people know what kind of transactions has taken place. But there are efficiency gains in terms of allowing things like liquidity savings in interbank payment. If I were paying Sonia today, I could, for, for say lunch yesterday, I could just wire her the whole sum of money in a sense. But in a network of a lot of banks in a sense, that uh, you imagine all the various liabilities and deals that you could pay out, means you've got to hold on to a lot of money before you actually do the transfer. How could we introduce things like, for example, netting to do some form of better efficient use of your capital. But that is direct contra contradictory to the privacy of your transactions. So how do we overcome that? And that is what, together with industry, we have done for the various uh, distributed ledger technologies, models that's out there. We are going to issue the reports. We are going to issue the source code itself into the open source domain itself, allowing the whole world to be able to enhance upon that. Because we do see a future where these technologies play an important role in financial services industry. Let me take that a bit further, so, and correct me if I'm wrong. So, if I'm a central bank, so, so conventionally, you have central bank, financial intermediaries, the large banks, if these in many cases, and then uh, man on the street, depositors, etc. So, based on what you're saying, couldn't it then be applied to the retail banking as well, not just wholesale banking, meaning why have the intermediaries in the first place? Mm. So, could, could we 
Sorry, Sonia, I didn't mean to, you know. <laughs> uh, but couldn't you, could, do you envisage a time where sort of it's the central bank, digital currencies or whatever, and individuals, and then banks go back to their old, their or sort of role of just sort of very narrow banking? In, I think we have economists down here, so I shall not <laughs> visit the, exactly the points with regards to the economics as well as the, uh, uh, the implications on financial stability, monetary policy transmission. Yeah. Those are uh, serious topics. You have researchers that's looking into them by virtue of instruction of central bank issued digital currencies. What is the implications on it, on the broader financial system mm. and the economy? And I think these are very, still are very uh, areas at which the economists and the, the researchers are still looking at this area. In fact, MAS, we also look at this very intensely as well. Um, and which is why a key part of the focus of the use of applying the distributed ledger technology is on the wholesale banking space. Yeah. Because that has, I think, more, much more manageable in terms of uh, in impact on the financial system itself. But of course, do we in the future? There might be a possibility where central banks issue their own digital currencies, whether or not it has to be based on distributed ledger technology. That, of course, I think is the technology is out there. There are various others as well, but I think we have not ruled out that. But my, I think this is a topic that requires still a lot more research and investigation. Fair enough, uh, Marek, you want to say? Yeah. Yeah, well, I have also this, the central bank perspective as a former member of Monetary Policy Council, so, so a person responsible for, for monetary policy uh, uh, in Poland. So our approach towards uh, uh, cryptocurrencies is very, let's say, very, very careful and, very, and also very, very conservative. But uh, uh, um, I, may, I may tell you that, that Polish central bank is also thinking about... Uh, its own uh, uh, e-currency. It would be called uh, Polish uh, e-zloty because so we, our currency is called Polish zloty, mm. so Polish e-zloty. But we, we have uh, we, uh, we have different approach towards uh, towards car cryptocurrencies, other currencies because they they're not controlled by by central mm. bank. So. So central bank itself is, is afraid that it can harm its monetary policy. And it, also, we have many many scams on this on this market. Uh, oh. the, there there were many, and uh, we have we we rather have this uh, wait and see policy. We we're very open uh, uh, to to blockchain technology itself. There's a there's a, I, I assume mm, uh, uh, great future. Uh, uh, in front of, uh, let's say, this, this technology. But uh, uh, in case of cryptocurrencies, we, we treat them right now as a commodity. Mm. Uh, um, and and uh, as I mentioned before, so we put security first, so we're not so, so, so open, but we think about is lot about official currency mm. uh, in this uh, being... Uh, Issued in this uh, blockchain uh, technology. Matthias, you want to add something? Yeah, um, just want to share a little bit more because uh, I, I thought that was a very interesting discussion. I think it's a paradigm shift that we're going to adopt in a very soon near future. Because why, why is a paradigm shift? You know, uh, just go back 20 years ago when I first, uh, I mean, when everything first started uh, appearing about internet and a few nodes, you know, all of us were thinking that, were thinking that internet was just an information place. But today, we know that it's more than that. It changes the way we behave. It changes the way we think, even the way we communicate our kids. In, in fact, it has such a paradigm shift. Today, we can live in a world without two days of food, but cannot be without two hours of internet. That could be our world. That's, that's our world today. So when I say it's a paradigm shift in blockchain, it is going to be a shift where today, we think that you know, it's a new thing, something you can add on to it. But in 10 years down the road, it could be something that you cannot live without. Because there could be a world without, I mean, I'm just throwing out here, it could be a world without auditors. Because of blockchain. It could be a world without the middleman. Because blockchain, objective is to, like what I say, decentralize the ledger. That if one node gets down, you still have all other nodes to validate. The security paradigm shift is so immense that it takes a while for us to get it. To understand how we can leverage this such intense 
uh, technology, or I'm not so sure what you call it. <laughs> is it technology or is it a, 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 a dimension? Now you can use it in almost everything, like in healthcare, whether it's in validating of documents, whether it's in, in, in even our uh, against fraud, I mean fraud is definitely against fraud, uh, uh, financial uh, uh, consistency, you know, trust, to ensure that is enabled. And soon enough, you'll see our roles of our middlemen starting to disperse and getting the, the power, just like Uber. Uber's uh, strength is not on the centralized transport system. It's doing away with all the uh, hardcore ownership of transportation and decentralize it to the people. So blockchain is like that. It's a paradigm shift. Sorry. Sonia, you want to add anything? No, 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 that's fine. fine. Okay, good. Everything said in the so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before I throw it open, uh, let me come back to something Damien said about the MAS approach. And I don't, again, don't want to make this uh, about MAS, but it's my, uh, so robo-advisors, right? And if the uh, rest of you please uh, come in as well. So, so MAS has said, uh, applies a materiality, materiality and proportionality uh, test before they decide about uh, whether to impose regulation, right? So, and this is purely from my own perspective. So, uh, so I've started looking at robo-advisors. There are a few in Singapore, there may be more, but there are two or three main ones. So, uh, are things like that, so when you think, are they all regulated under, uh, so, when, so when I open an account uh, with a robo-advisor, uh, what, I'm not talking about guarantees about return, but guarantees about issues relating to fraud, cybersecurity, et cetera. Is there, do they all come under some umbrella? Yes. Is my money safe? Yeah. No, so <laughs> as in all, <laughs> as in the disclaimer of all financial services products, there's no, there are investment sure. risks. Hmm. So you may lose all your money in the sense with any investment. Yeah. But I think by and large, it's about the recognizing that the opportunities that uh, robo-advisors or digital advisors bring to the mass market recognizing that it is a, uh, a low cost, transparent, and reasonable way of allowing consumers, the general public itself, to be able to better invest their money. So bearing that in mind, the sets of regulations that has to be applicable has to be targeted towards areas where the risks are such as, since I just give you an example, I'm not going to elaborate the entire, sure. all the regulations can be applicable. i just give you an example. If we are talking about digital advisors for the general public, understanding that their financial and investment sophistication in terms of knowledge is even there. So could we manage the risk by the type of products that robo-advisors shall, uh, when it comes to constituting the, uh, the portfolio itself, could we have some restrictions around that? And that's how we've done it. An example would be keeping it to the type of um, ETFs, non-ETFs, in terms of their proportions. That's how we have generally given as, as a set of regulations in terms of how can such digital advisors be made available to the mass market. Okay. Yeah, I, I, full, I fully agree with Damien. We have also robot advisors uh, in, in Poland, and so we see it as an opportunity to, to give uh, an average client, a mass market, uh, the, the same availability of, of, of this kind of, of, of services that are not available for average Paul right now. So it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity. Of course, there are some, some, some from time to time, some, some problems with the technology, with machine learning, with uh, AI, and, and uh, we're examining that, but uh, we're going in the same same direction. We we, we allow that to be uh, element of our financial sector. Yeah, all of you have been very patient. So let me throw it out to the audience. If you have any questions, I'll take. Uh, see, it. Well, I'll, I'll just start from here and we'll move there. Okay, please. Uh, the mic is behind you, so. Hi, my name's uh, Tom Wills. I work with an advisory, fintech advisory firm in Singapore called uh, OnTrack. And my question to the panel is about cryptocurrencies. Do you, in each of your different roles that you approach cryptocurrencies, do you view them today and tomorrow as a form of payment or an investment asset or both? And of course, I'm, I'm asking that because of the whole ICO phenomenon 
where people are now buying and selling cryptocurrencies with the hope of, of them going up in value. And that seems like a sort of a, a mission shift from what cryptocurrencies were originally about. So appreciate your comments and all that. So you're talking about the existing cryptocurrencies as opposed to whether central banks will issue their own sovereign? Not really, but more about, the ex more, more about whether you see, whether the panel sees cryptocurrencies eventually as a way of payment, okay. which is how they were originally designed, yeah. versus an investment asset for people to buy and sell, or maybe do they coexist? Okay. Uh, before I get the panelists, uh, anyone have a remotely sim similar question related to that? Cryptocurrencies, okay, please, and then you. The mic, please, oh, thank you. I'm an economist by training, and this is also in relation to his uh, question. Because uh, when you talk about currency, you talk about the signature right of the state to enjoy the premium of a Signal. currency. So how are you going to address the issue of signature right in this particular case of a cryptocurrency? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Uh, with regard to the, <clears throat> the first questionnaire, with regard to the imputation, and which you guys did not, unfortunately, did not address. Cryptocurrencies is just coin and token. There's no notes. It's not a currency. So the misconception among speakers and deliverers normally, they do not understand what they're talking about. That is what I'm trying to say here. They don't know fintech.com, fintech.net is purely the basis of liquor selling but they adopted it blindfully. That's normal in a circumstances. So coming back to that matter. Now you notice that the misconception because the question is that Ethereum now has become a replacement of a new middleman. That's what uh, Symantec guys forgotten to say that there has a new player, a new, a, new, a new broker now coming in. Because you know why that is where nobody talk about it. It's not, you know, Uber and Ethereum is about the same. Now, Uber is purely service rendered, not something else. So I, I put the question later because you know why there seems to be too many infrastructure problems that regulators do not wish to address. And mind yourself from Poland that, you know, uh, you know, cryptocurrency is not a commodity. It's not a commodity. It's Forex. And the question is that if you misunderstood the fundamental, then you go haywire. Now, one my concern about Singapore is, because when Polish give so much regard, every country gives Singapore regard so much about what we attain to be, you've forgotten the infrastructure, number one. You've got to know that we are internet control. So what can you really achieve with internet control for a global undertaking? Number two, that the question is that when you look at the possibility that there are too many, which is very much generic. Your sandbox doesn't cover the real uh, you know, structural requirement, business model, and whatever dynamics. So it's very much it's a startup kind of undertaking, not a grown-up undertaking. So I'll leave it to you. Thanks. So anyone want to answer that? But more generally about, uh, okay. uh, about the issue of crypto market, about cryptocurrency, Poland is actually very... Uh, seems to be, do you have a lot of active private, uh, private activity? I know you said from a regulatory perspective, you're very concerned yeah. about yeah. private cryptocurrencies. Uh, you want to talk a bit, a bit about that? Yeah, uh, so, uh, so even my family members, they, they, they use cr cryptocurrencies, and, and I'm worried about that, <laughs> because we, we treat, sorry for that, but, but we treat as, as uh, Chinese regulators, for example, we treat, uh, uh, Cryptocurrencies right now as a commodity, uh, so so not as a way of uh, as a way of payment. I, I told you that at the beginning that we're conserv very conservative, and our central bank is is uh, very conservative uh, um, and in the way we, we treat cryptocurrencies. We're very open to to blockchain technology, but uh, here. Uh, uh, of course, it's it's illegal. I mean, I mean, cryptocurrencies they're legal in Poland, but uh, we have a very uh, conservative approach, uh, and a little bit different one that that uh, uh, that uh, MAS right now. Yeah. I, 
think the complexity, you rightfully alluded to the point about the, the, the cryptocurrencies, recognition that the, there are coins and tokens. Less so that MES recognizes it as coins, we recognize it as tokens. But these tokens are so versatile, they could actually represent all kinds of characteristics and all kinds of assets. There are situations where you use it for the purpose of payments. There are others who take it on as an as a, as a asset for investment. There are others who use it for other purposes. In the latest ICOs, uh, using it even within the ICOs themselves, we are looking at a broad spectrum of way at which these tokens are being characterized and the kind of assets they represent, the kind of rights they are given to the persons who are holding on to those tokens. So there isn't a one size fits all and from MS point of view is that we have taken on not about recognizing their commodities or recognizing them they are currencies, but going back to the basic, what are they used for? If they are used for accessing certain utilities, accessing as a form of payments, then as, as for that purpose, MES doesn't regulate them as they work in those ways. But we are targeted towards the risk where they impose, they, they pose things like, for example, uh, money laundering or terrorism financing. So those are the areas that we target when it comes to tokens that's having or bearing such characteristics. But if the token starts to move into, as we have seen in some of those ICOs, moving into uh, securities, moving into debentures, moving to collective investment schemes, those are the areas that recognizing for tokens what they are, then we have to regulate them based on our existing Securities and Futures Act. That's just our set of regulations that's applicable to uh, sort of, of, of whatever instruments that's representing or of such, bearing such characteristics. Because ultimately, they are performing such functions. We, we have to go back to the basics. What exactly are those tokens doing? Yeah, yes. um, just to answer some of the questions that was being uh, posed. Uh, I think again need to clarify on these two terms. I think because like, technologies terminology is very important. Mm. Blockchain is not cryptocurrency. Neither is cryptocurrency blockchain. But blockchains assist cryptocurrency to have a trail and traceability, so that uh, cryptocurrency is not used for uh, fraud and transactions. And then why is that so important? Because in this day and age, uh, there are many uh, bad actors. Like for example, you know you guys heard of ransomware. You heard of run a cry, right? I mean, how do you know? Uh, how do I know if a uh, 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 hacking issues or an issue of security threats become a world, worldwide known? Is when your mom come and ask you about it. So my mom came and asked me. So why what's wanna cry? You know, why is it on the TV? My mom cooking in the kitchen asking me about wanna cry or in somewhere. So many times when they ask you to pay and ask you to do something, it's usually through something that's not traceable, and cryptocurrency was initially used for that. But because of the introduction of blockchain, it could change that because it creates trust and creates traceability. <coughs> now, going back again, what is cryptocurrency? Uh, is it for in investment or is it for transaction? Well, it's a very hard question. Because, I mean, okay, I'm not an economist. <laughs> I'm a technologist by nature. But from my understanding of economy is that, you know, currency is based on uh, something as a backing. Whether it's a financial stability of a country or gold or you know uh, commodities that back it up, and cryptocurrency, that's a challenge. There's no backing of such, and that's why using it as an investment, I'm not so sure it's a good idea, because I think it's going to cause a situation. I mean, of course, everybody uh, look backwards and says, "How oh, I wish I was the guy who bought ten thousand coins at one dollar per coin." <laughs> Today I'll be a millionaire. Everybody will look back. Hindsight is twenty twenty. But we do not know what is the future. The foresight is a dangerous one. Why if today 4,000 uh, big dollar Bitcoin become $1 next, next few years? Then you'll hope that you're not the guy that is investing in the Bitcoin today. So the thing is that because of that, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, maybe you can give a, I mean, from, from BBS, can be a better advisor for that. But transactional, that's interesting. Because it's bypassing all the transactions, I would say uh, uh, payment, or it's doing away, back then, uh, going back to the same point again, it's going back away from the traditional of how, how currency are traded, from the exchange rate, so on. Now you're using cryptocurrency as a trading form of, uh, of a transaction. So that could be an interesting thing. So I, I think just a highlight of whatever that was shared earlier. So just a quick rejoinder to the question about Sunyaraj and uh, cryptocurrency. So here you want to differentiate the sovereign 
issuance versus private sector issuance, right? If you're talking about private sector issuance and people start using it, so there's effective currency substitution, yes, you lose your senior Raj power. But if it's issued by the government, then there's still mm -hmm. that senior Raj power. Okay. Any, case. Uh, uh, any other questions, please? Perfectly fine. So we'll move away from cryptocurrencies. No more questions about crypto. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, very interesting uh, insights. I wanted to come back to the topic of blockchain. So um, I'm not sure if I'd agree with you, sir, on your uh, concern about uh, pr privacy being mm. an issue with uh, blockchain. Because in a public blockchain, sure, everyone can see the blocks, but that doesn't mean that they mm. can see the actual contents of the transaction, mm. because that would be protected, hopefully, by your private key. Mm. So I would see actually four other challenges with um, blockchain. One is um, scalability, processing power, storage, and the last one, which I find the most scary, is legal and compliance issues. So I know right now there is um, um, MAS has no say whatsoever. Has not. It, it's ba basically laissez-faire where blockchain is concerned. But I wanted to ask. Um, uh, what do you see coming in the future? Do you see a time where that would be regulated? Do you see any potential com legal or compliance issues with the uh, blockchain? Thank you. Any related questions? Blockchains, not crypto? No? Okay, Matthias, you want to? Yeah, I, I, I think a uh, good point because initially I was saying that back then, about a few years back or a few months back, uh, privacy is a concern. But because they added crypto uh, cryptography, Things are changing. So, in a sense, I'm saying that I, I, I mean, I'll just emphasizing on what Damien was sharing. It's a new startup, uh, a new introduction to the to the industry. And as new things are introduced, there will be risk, and they are addressing the risk little by little. So back then, blockchain was used for specifically addressing the traceability of Bitcoin. So that was on Bitcoin cryptocurrency, but that was the original intent. Then after that, as they move on to more usage they add on more functionalities like crypto, graphic, and so on. So that was one part of it. Uh, you're right that there are more, I mean, uh, being a technologist, right, there's a lot more little risk that we saw, like there's such a risk called side chaining. And we saw that these are the things that, I mean, I'm not saying a risk, that people are, uh, are thinking about. It says, could that be a risk to what the current ledger is about? Can we mess up the ledger and stuff like that? Mm. So currently, these are all speculation. It's not proven. In a sense of that, there's a working POC that the hacker did that come out affect the the, uh, the nature of this uh, theory. Mm -hmm. So far, uh, there's more positive than negative. But you're right that there will be more uh, uh, less of technology discussion, but more of implication. Like what's the legal and compliance about it? Um, in terms of processing power, I don't not I'm not mm -hmm. so sure if that's going to be the future concern, because you can see that even our life are changing. We are having more processing power than we have on the phone than on a laptop, it potentially could be that. So in a sense that if, let's say, this distributed nature of vision that you are going towards, mm -hmm. uh, that may not be a concern, but you're right. The most important thing is to address is the legal implication of, can it be a legitimate source of validity that we know that this, uh, this, nat this, this, this approach is a way forward to verify and validate transaction, uh, that uh, authenticity in a, in a sense. So awesome. from our, our point of view, this, uh, just a little bit on the, on the blockchain and cryptocurrencies, I think we are very careful regarding the, the cryptocurrency, so we do not offer any investment products in <laughs> <laughs> cryptocurrencies in, in DBS. A blockchain, we are, we are running a couple of experiments because we think it's a, it's a future, um, and we are also very closely cooperating with MAS on the, on the future regulations for that. Um, I believe that, um, you know, just agreeing with what uh, Matthias said, um, the technology is not an issue. It's usually faster developing that we that we always always think. The compliance and the legal considerations are there, and the work of everything, the matter of trust and the matter of security and uh, privacy of data is of utmost importance. So, if anything, I think that's something that we should probably focus on the most. Let's take a few more questions. There was one. Maybe uh, maybe I'll oh, just ahead, sorry, touch then. on yeah, a little bit ahead. about the, the part where. Uh, the kind of regulations that are expected by virtue of introductions of distributed ledger technology itself. I think MES, we have taken a conscious view, we avoid direct regulations on technology. Today we have distributed ledger technology. What if tomorrow there is a new set of technologies that come around that is better than DLTs? In fact, our approach is more towards targeted, towards outcome-based uh, regulations. We are aimed at uh, uh, making sure that investors' protection 
customer's protection, safety and soundness of the financial system itself. So if we target our regulations based on those principles, be it today we have DLT, tomorrow we have another set of technology itself, they still, they still should aim to meet all those principles. I give you an example of cloud services. Sonia mentioned earlier about the cloud services. If you look at years back, there is already outsourcing. Cloud services was just another extension of that. In sense, if you look at the, the, the general terms, how it looks like. If we had very targeted technology-based requirements, regulatory requirements, we might inadvertently stifle financial institutions' adoption of the cloud services, which we all know, which we are pretty certain you have uh, in your private life access emails and other services over the internet, which is hosted on the cloud. Similarly, financial services are leveraging our cloud services, harnessing the benefits from all such cloud services that be it applications, be it other types of platforms, services that is now enabled through cloud. We need to be targeted towards the outcome, the principles of why we're doing certain things. Because we will inadvertently be stifling the very things that may help us transform the financial industry to be better, but ultimately for consumers like us, for the players themselves as well. We're running a bit short of time, so let me take some quick questions and then we'll throw it up to the panelists. Please. I think uh, I got like two brief questions, probably to most possibly to, to Sonia. Um, one is about uh, you mentioned like you're introducing new technologies in some. Uh, countries outside of Singapore. So are there any specific countries that act as a test bed for new technologies for DBS outside of Singapore, or, ma or maybe it's, it's Singapore um, itself? And also a connected question, uh, don't you think that it's probably easier to uh, introduce new banking technologies in developing countries rather than uh, in developed countries such as Singapore or Poland? Since um, people in developing countries, they might lack the infrastructure needed for traditional banking, say branches, uh, local branches. So they are more keen of using uh, new technologies instead of, of uh, people that are used to, uh, to traditional bank banking like in Poland and Singapore. And don't you think that uh, in future developed countries might lose out on potentially new, uh, new technologies not being introduced to them? Thank you. Uh, any other questions? The two. So I saw three hands, so I'll take those three questions and we'll... Uh, my name is uh, Ido, I'm from Indonesia and I'm a student here in LKY school. So my question is related to that. So I want to ask Sonia about uh, Indonesia particularly because uh, the regulators there is not quite receptive or responsive like in India with biometrics and in uh, mass Singapore. So how do you apply this cutting edge technology in digital banking without cu cutting the regulatory corner? And for Damien, like, I want to ask like, whether MAS doing any action or plan to minimize the intra-region gap about this financial innovation? Because we know that Singapore is in the, form, in the forefront for the financial innovation in Asia, but the, the region itself is not quite that savvy in terms of financial technology. Okay, thank you. There's another hand there. Good morning. My name is Adrian. I'm from Accenture Consulting. And my question, my question ties to what was said before around stimulation of financial innovations. So how would you increase the adoption in light of ever stringent uh, regulatory requirements? First, 99% of us are not the headlines of newspapers. So how to cater to the 99% rather than the 1% that might be causing some trouble and what we see in the headlines. Hi, my name is uh, Sadar. I'm with the Dubai Financial Services Authority. I'm a director of supervision there. So I have no doubt questions more than uh, more to the uh, regulators here, but two of them. One of them is about um, looking at the regulations as they pertain to the operational risk. A lot of you guys are talked about you know, cyber risk, security, and so on and so forth. They, un they all fall under the operational risk as we speak right now. And the, the work there is relatively scattered and it's really dated considering all the developments going on. Do you see, uh, have you guys been looking at that at all? That's uh, one. 
And in relation to that, uh, and as it, as it pertains to the, um, the service providers, we just talked about cloud uh, services and so on and so forth. Do you see the perimeters of regulation kind of moving towards there at all? Because right now we look at the outsourcing as a part of the job that the banks have to do. Well, you have to do your due diligence, for example, for the cloud services. Uh, but if you look at the events that are happening, say, in Equifax in New York, in the US, which uh, 150 million people affected, do you see regulations creeping up into that area? Thank you. I'll take one very last question, the lady behind you. Good morning, thank you very much for the good insights. I'm Magda Shelley, Managing Director of Responsible Cyber. And my question is actually related to the GDPR, Global Protection Data Regulation. Uh, in fact, it is actually very popular in Europe and a priority for most of the companies. What about the impact of the GDPR for the fintech industry in general? And what about the impact on the collaboration between Singapore and let's say Poland, for example? How we can raise the awareness about the topic that, from my experience, is actually in Singapore, not at least with my customers, and especially within the SME market, not yet enough popular. Thank you. Thanks. So um, let's have Sonia first talk about digital divide developing countries, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, um, very interesting question, and very true. Uh, the reason we started our, our challengers Digiban in India uh, was because the regulations were allowing that, because of the one billion Indians having the other card and us being able to do the biometric verification. Um, so yes, it was very much driven by that. But not only that, we also tested a couple of other uh, very new technologies at that time. And remember, it was um, uh, two years ago. Uh, we went with, with artificial intelligence that we have applied as the only way um, to provide customer service to our customers. So you can imagine no contact center at all a robot talking to our customers and providing all those uh, different services in case it cannot handle, it's being transferred to a life agent. But it's only about 20% of those cases. So we got a very small contact center with uh, 1.6 million of, of customers. We also put a very innovative technology for um, transaction signing and authorization. We have replaced the hard token that many people know of in Singapore with a soft token with a very innovative technology provided by a fintech startup company from Singapore, Viki, and we tested it again in the Indian market. We got the uh, approval from MAS and the local regulator, and then we went to Indonesia. After a couple of months, when it proved to be very efficient and safe, we actually brought back those technologies to our core market. So we currently have our uh, robot on Facebook Messenger in POSB in Singapore. We started um, also on our public website. So you can go and you can start chatting with the robot. We've got about 80,000 customers chatting with the robot every day in Singapore. And, and the soft token is there. So now when you're using our Digibank in, in Singapore, uh, you actually do not need a hard token for both the low risk as well as high risk transactions. So this, it was a testing ground. We brought it uh, to our core market. Mm -hmm. uh, also tricky questions regarding um, our uh, the less developed countries more open to new technologies or not. You know, on one side, uh, looking at, for example, at Kenya, when they started the SMS banking, remember the, the M-Pesa thing, yes? It's, it just jumped into, immediately into, into the mobile because that was the only infrastructure they had. Thinking back about Poland, where I started 19, in 1994, where the banking industry was fledgling and we never had checks, and you'll be laughing, but after more than 20 years of banking experience, mm. I went to Malaysia into Standard Chartered Bank. I saw check for the first time in my life. Because in Poland, we never had them. We went into cards, into debit cards, prepaid cards, credit cards immediately. So yes, there is this thing that when you are jumping onto the bandwagon of development, you are usually embracing the, the latest technology. But that's, that's not always the case. And there are some blurred cases like China, is it the developing market or oh, it's a developed market? Yes, you're looking at WeChat and send Alibaba. Yes, $25 billion of sales in 24 hours for the single day. Much bigger than Amazon has ever achieved. So, you know, these things of the blurred technologies and the new thing are blurring the way of our perception. I will give you an anecdote. I, I was hosting a group of Google interns that were traveling all around the world from Silicon Valley to learn what's going on in the different countries. And I was telling them 
about India. And I was telling them what we do there, about the AI, about the biometrics, about our digital bank that does not require any physical interaction. And they were coming from the United States, from Google. And you know, 10 people out of the 20 people group, it's a secret I do not want you to share with anyone, came after the presentation to me and said, can we join you? Because we do not want to be to do the maps. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's really very interesting. But one of those defining moments in my career that the whole develop, developing is, is, is very different. And it's again redefining and disrupting. Okay, so that's the, the question out based up of my experience. Indonesia. Indonesia regulator is very supportive. We actually are able to do the biometric verification exactly the same as we do in India. The difference between the biometric ID that 150 million of Indonesians have currently in their pockets, maybe now a little bit more, is that unlike in India, the biometric data is stored on a card. It's not oh. in the, it, it's there on the, in, the, in the central um, database, but it's also on the card. So what we are doing in Indonesia, we are actually capturing the data from the card itself, and then, and then we are sending it to the bank and they are doing the, the biometric authentication. That information is just going automatically through all the sanctions lists, special, special designated nationals, special de designated individuals, terrorists, and so on, so to complete the know your customer policy. But I would say that, you know, the thing that I also, the phenomena that I have uh, observed in the region is that the regulators are observing each other. And they really want to be on the top of uh, what's going on, and then there is a lot of learnings that is happening. <laughs> yeah, we would like to. <laughs> sure, yeah. And also the fact, and can I just, just um, also reveal the secret that um, the Polish regulator and the Singaporean regulator are going to sign a memorandum of understanding this week at the, at the FinTech Festival. It's also talking to me that being so far away, it's about 20,000 kilometers, if I'm not mistaken, between the two countries, the regulators want to share and cooperate just to learn as much as we can. So let me just clearly don't share any secrets with Sonia. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, Damien, very quickly, because we need to wrap up on yeah. operational risk that was pointed. Well, maybe I'll just touch on the, the part as well with regards to the, if you talk about the emerging markets, talking about mm -hmm. developed markets, in terms of regulators, sophistication of regulators, and, or the regulatory uh, landscape itself, it doesn't really there are differences across the jurisdictions. It's just not just an ASEAN thing. There was an earlier question about that. But I think one of the, the key things is about recognizing that for fintech to be able to better flourish itself, uh, there are opportunities that even among regulators, we could look into uh, other areas where some of those regulations could be harmonized, could be more co coherent. And that's something that, that we have done. Uh, we are working with the IFC World Bank, uh, as well as the ASEAN Bankers Association, uh, we have started something called the ASEAN Financial Innovation Network. You will, if you are attending the FinTech conference over the next few days, you will be able to find out more about that as well. So that is one area in which not just the players, given the opportunities to be able to better interact and better be able to test out the uh, FinTech solutions that's out there, but even opportunities for regulators to come together, look into how these FinTechs are able to provide solutions and therefore, the kind of regulations that we impose onto that particular uh, regulatory activity itself should be one that is harmonized to allow these fintechs to be able to better flourish. Now, on the part about the ops risk and the non-ops risk, I think as a regulator, we don't just look into just the ops risk. There are also other areas of uh, risk that we do have to, uh, we have to be mindful about. But it all also depends on the individual uh, financial services activity that we're referring to. If you look at payments, then we better be more concerned about your safety of, the safety of your money, in a sense. If you look into uh, robo-advisors, we also have to be mindful about the, the risk that's applicable to your investment portfolio. And it's not just about the immediate term, but over the longer term. Whether or not you understand the risk that you are embarking on, and uh, what are your goals, making sure that you understand what you're getting into. So there are non-operational risks, and they are uh, very much dependent on the financial services activities that the fintechs are introducing down here, that the incumbents are also looking to how they innovate, be able to bring on board technology to be able to serve customers better. But it this has to be relevant, appropriate, and mat uh, uh, material itself, targeted towards the exact risk areas. That is what, as regulators, we are doing. Matthias, you have 15 seconds you want. Any closing seconds. comments? <laughs> 15 seconds starting from now. So I have seen, uh, I think, in the years of uh, technology that was involved, I mean, I'm, I'm a technologist from 
the start of my career, uh, I've never seen something so exciting because the evolution of technology has been so, uh, it's like if you're at the curve, you're at the evolutionary curve that, you know, next year we don't know what this year will hold. Uh, I mean, this year will not know what this year will hold. Next year will not know what this next year will be, the evolving yeah. things that we oh, adopt. Good, good. So it's natural that there's some chaos because uh, uh, of the, uh, 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 the things that we're adopting, how it's disrupting the market. So I think that's why uh, that's bound to have a lot more questions of how regulation is going to address that, how security risk is going to be addressed. But I think uh, going that, we should not stifle innovation because that's how we transform our companies and that's how we transform and giving us a cutting edge. So given as that, I think uh, this is a great forum. I, I thought I enjoyed myself. I have all these questions. And sometimes these are the teething issues. We need to have hard questions to be asked so that we can address those. Uh, reason being that you know, we are moving so fast that sometimes there are certain things that are catching up. And that's why we need to have that as something that we're constantly having to talk about, the experts, the people that come together to share with us some of the new things that we have seen in the market. I started with Marek, so let me end with him, especially with regard to the question yeah. about the GDPR. Sorry. Yeah, a question concerning GDPR and its impact on, on uh, fintechs. Well, there will be for sure uh, a strong impact on, on, on uh, fintechs' uh, efficiency and uh, effectiveness, but I would like to underline that we have to, to uh, also take uh, into account the fact that the uh, European Union is implementing uh, uh, law called PSD2, Payment Systems Directive 2, and uh, we're implementing, I mean, European Commission is implementing, uh, and, and we're implementing in Poland, uh, uh, something called open banking. So there, will, there are going to be third-party providers that, that will gain access to, to banking services uh, uh, on, a, on a, well, I have limited time, different, different scale, let's say. And uh, GDPR is connected with PSD2, and uh, there will be some, some uh, transfer of, of credentials. We have to be certain that it, will be, that it is going to be safe. There are banks, for example, not banks, but uh, third, third party providers, like, for example, Tesco right now. And uh, Tesco is, uh, yeah. is uh, 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 um, uh, uh, how is it called? A super supermarket that uh, has got over 20 million clients in, in Great Britain, and there will be also small fintechs and 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 big ones uh, uh, as a third-party providers, and that's why the the case of uh, GDPR uh, and da data protection is is so important. So we cannot uh, evaluate it without the, the full perspective. And, and last one remark concerning first question about this uh, test ground and, and developing countries. Poland is uh, listed among developed countries, but uh, we cannot uh, share, uh, let's say, clients and, and see this division between developed and developing uh, countries because, for example, in Poland we have uh, very... Uh, uh, visible division between two groups of clients. Those are elder ones and uh, mm. especially millennials, those who are very open to, to novelties. And they are uh, very often a test ground for, for uh, uh, fintechs and, and banks and uh, insurance companies. So uh, sometimes within uh, developed uh, economies, there are certain groups of, of clients and you can treat them as a uh, uh, as a test ground, so you cannot, you don't have to look uh, any much farther in, in developing countries, but you, you only have to to find uh, uh, a, a, a certain group of, of people like like those millennials, uh, young ones in, in Poland, that is very open to to all 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 that is innovative. They're eager to test anything. You you well. <laughs> You, you provide them as a, as a new, uh, new, uh, new thing, especially on, on, on mobile oh, sorry. We, on we, mobile phones. Thanks. I'm Thank sorry to interrupt. Uh, we could yeah. go on and on. My fault, bad time management. Uh, I'm yeah. sure you all agree that the uh, panelists have been really good sports. Like I said, they didn't know the questions I was going to ask. So if you join, uh, join me in giving them a round of applause, please. <laughs> and, and, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>